the scripture reading, first scripture reading is taken from Exodus 16, verses 2 to 4 and 9 to 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Here ends your meaning. And our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 24 through 35. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. This is right after the feeding of the 5,000. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us try our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the moral of the story is, is serve food and people will come. Over the years, I have worked with different congregations and different denominations, and, and it's so funny because people think like they're the only ones who like food. You're like, oh, we're Baptists. We like food. Or the Methodists will say, oh, you know, there must be food involved if, if it's a Methodist gathering. And I, you know, they're always like, it's kind of universal. Presbyterians, you know, we like food too. My former church we used to have these miserable, miserable council meetings, like a session meeting, but we called it council. 
And in one of my attempts to make them, to make them more as palatable as you can be, anyway, uh, was one time I'm like, you know, I'm going to bring food and see what happens, whether they'll be less grumpy. They, they just didn't want to be there. And the meeting went wonderfully. And at the end, I'm like, okay, we can never meet again if there's not food on the table. And they were like, okay, that's good. And, and they bought in and we rotated. We would bring food every month. A more serious story. I was an exchange student when I was in high school. At the age of 16, I went to Chile, or Chile, which is that long, thin country on the Pacific coast of, of South America. And uh, it was 1984. The, uh, the government was a military dictatorship under General Augusto Pinochet. And it was the first time in my life that I encountered true poverty. And I remember when I would walk, I, I lived for half of my time there in a, in a city called Viña del Mar. And you fly into Santiago, which is the capital, make a beeline to the coast, and there's Viña. And a city of about half a million people. And when I would go into the, into the center of town, the metropolis, um, I rem remember going to sit in a, in, in a cafe you know, outside on, on the street. And you could tell that I was not from there. I'm tall, I'm fair-skinned, I have light eyes. And just by the way people dress, you can tell. Um, and so I would attract a lot of attention and uh, would also attract attention of a lot of children who would bet. And I remember sitting in this cafe and, and the kids walked in and you know, dirty clothes, dirty feet, these big brown eyes and their hands cupped and they would say, dame, dame una moneda, por favor, dame una moneda, which means give me, please give me a coin. Please give me a coin. And my family said, don't, don't give them anything, otherwise they'll never leave you. They'll never leave you alone. And last week we talked about moments that you remember. This is a moment I remember when you decide not to see what's right in front of you. Not to see people who are obviously there and to ignore the suffering. And I think it wounds the soul a little bit. And it created in me, of course, a longing to live in a world where children would never have to bang on the street. Jesus has just fed 5,000 plus. And the plus is that they didn't count women and children. <laughs> so there's a lot more than 5,000 people there. He had pity on them and he encouraged them, the disciples, to give what they have, you know, give what you have, give it away. But now the people follow after him asking for more, asking to know the trick, you know, teach us, you know, what did you do so that all this bread came so that we might never be hungry? And Jesus sounds unsympathetic in his response, uh, but we know his teachings in the Matthew 25, you know. Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked. To, you know, Matt, earlier, you know, in Matthew, do not, do not store up yourselves, you know, treasures on earth. We know that Jesus is down with feeding people. He just did it. And the conversation with these folks is really similar to a conversation you had with the woman at the well of Samaritan woman two chapters before, you know, where she's, they're talking about water. You want water? I will give you living water and you will never be thirsty. And here in chapter six, if you want bread, I will give you the bread of life and you will never be hungry. What does he mean? Oh, he's obviously he's not being literal. Not literal hunger, not literal thirst. The bread to which Jesus was, refers is, is to that which or who gives life to the world. According to scripture, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Now, the word eternal here in Greek, ionios, refers to a qualitative state, not a quantitative state. We're not talking about a length of time or somebody's lifetime. We're talking about a quality of life. Eternal means timeless, out of time. It's not, it's not future focused, it's present focused. It's the quality of life now, in this time. 
And I remember thinking as a teenager when I, you know, when the church was really working hard to indoctr indoctrinate me into the faith. Uh, I, you know, I just remember thinking, if all of this is about some future time, then it's bogus. It has to make a difference here and now. Eternal life starts now. Salvation starts now. Faith in Jesus Christ makes a difference now. And I think we have been living the best sermon example for this in the last year and a half. I mean, last week I talked about the, the, the hoarding of food and, and how that affected me or affected us. And obviously I didn't starve. But almost every day I thought to myself, how are people doing this without faith? I got out of bed in the morning because of my faith. I imagine you got out of bed in, in the morning because of your faith. Can I hear an amen? amen? One foot in front of the other, meeting the challenges of the day, and keeping our hearts open to, to seeing what was going on around us and in the world and responding. Not ignoring, but looking and doing something. You know, one of the reasons uh, that I'm that I'm here. I was so encouraged to see that your that your church that your leadership made a statement on Black Lives Matter. And I know that that that's controversial for some folks. And and we can talk about that. We have the rest of our lives to talk about that because this is the work of the rest of our lives. Right? Jesus in chapter four spoke about his food. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me. This is our food too. To believe in Jesus is to love the world in word and deed, in thought, but also in action. And rather than turn away from the hurting world, we try to be a bomb. I really, I, I would love to get this, that word out of my vocabulary because I always have to explain it because it sounds like bomb. But no, B-A-L-M. Like we, we're to be healing, to be a healing presence, to bring healing to the world. So whether it's Black Lives Matter, I see you, I hear you, I stand with you, your life matters. And my mantra to myself is show up, shut up, and work for change. Or whether it's standing with families, willing to wear the mask until everyone can be vaccinated. It's MESH, feeding the homeless or supporting family promise, which is homeless ministry. This work is the, in the world is the food that feeds our souls. And we know it. I'm paraphrasing something that I heard this week, uh, but I was talking about hopelessness. So the folks who, who uh, are despairing are the folks who tend to just sit back and cr criticize. Like somebody should do something. Hopeful folks are do something, even a small thing. And it's for, it heals this place. It gives hope to, to our own souls that we can do something to make the world a better place. Part of, you know, part of recovery for alcoholics, the, toward the 12 steps, is to be in service to others. To be part of the healing, we are healed. Make of me an instrument, St. Francis prayed. Uh, did you know that St. Francis came from a lot of money? And he was called into, into war, and he was way more ambitious than he was talented or strong. And he was taken prisoner, and it was in that prison, deprived of everything, that he found the most important thing. Knowledge of God, that God is with us and God is for us, which satisfies the soul. St. Augustine wrote that our souls are restless until they find the rest in me. We are hungry for the living God. We are fed in faith and then called to literally feed, to give ourselves away in love to the world. So I remember last week, the disciples looking at Jesus saying, what do we do? Give what you have. When compassion is offered in bread and cup, as well as word and the word, lives are transformed. Eternal life begins. Um, I, you know, I think now, uh, you know, what I would have done differently when I was 16 on the streets of Vina and Maj, surrounded by, by um, poor children begging. And I don't know, uh, the, the currency there are pesos, you know, everything. So like uh, 100 pesos is like $1. 
And if I had had, you know, if I had changed money and just gave away a coin, and I would like to think that I would have asked them their names and I would have asked them their help in helping me learn Spanish. Uh, what do you call this? What do you call this? What do you call this? To see them and interact with them. Um, and, and I know that there, you know, I know that there's some skepticism in that, but I also know, you know, I, there wasn't, I didn't have a bottomless pit of money. I came with a certain amount of money, but I also know that I spent a lot of money on beer and cigarettes that year. Cien pesos, but not a lot. As an adult, I mean, th these are formative experiences. So when, uh, so as an adult, I work to live in a world where little children might not have to beg on the streets. It's what we do with our money. It's, it's what we encourage our representatives to do in, in government, what to support and what not to support. Uh, it means working for a just world, fighting for equity. As God's children, we aspire to love God, neighbor, self. Believing in Jesus means making that our life's work, our life's work. And as we are fed, fed from above, we are feeding those around us. Souls are fed, bellies are filled. And it's a win-win for us and for the world. Uh, Jesus did not turn the people away empty. He gave them everything that they needed. At this table, we are reminded that we have everything that we need to live in faith. Jesus shows up for us. Jesus is with us and in us, making it so we can give flesh to the love of God, to a world that is hungry to know love and justice and peace. In Jesus' name, amen.